Hello folks and welcome to today's webinar, uh, The Role of Farms in Decentralized Composting. Uh, I'm Linda Bilsons Brolis of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative and we're your hosts for this uh, webinar. But also joining me now is my colleague at ILSR, Megan Matthews. She'll be helping, uh, keep it, helping us keep the webinar running smoothly. Say hi, say hi Megan. Hi everybody, welcome. Hey. Awesome. All right. So while we're waiting to uh, for folks to finish joining, um, are you all hearing that feedback? I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video just in case. Okay. So uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with our work. Um, ILSR's Composting for Community Initiative is advancing composting to reduce waste, enhance local soils, create community development opportunities, and to protect the climate. Our focus is to catalyze distributed food waste composting options that include home, community, and on-farm scales, and we work to promote locally-based composting in a number of different ways. Uh, we convene a national community composter coalition, and host national uh, cultivating community composting forums. We work one-on-one -on -one with communities through technical assistance and policy support. We produce reports, infographics, and various templates for composting sites. Uh, we host regular webinars and even a podcast. We also have a map that shows initiatives around the US and the policies and programs that are advancing composting at this scale. And uh, Megan will be adding some links to the chat for you to check some of that out. But you can also find uh, all of these resources on our website. Uh, if you go to ilsr.org forward slash composting, you'll see a composting resources drop down menu on the right hand side of the screen. And from there, you can select reports, podcasts, webinars, and more. Uh, we also offer technical training through our Neighborhood Soil Rebuilders Composter Training Program. And for anyone that's interested in more training on uh, the composting science, uh, we released a self-paced online Community Composting 101 certificate course. Uh, we released that earlier this year. Uh, the course covers composting fundamentals and the ins and outs of starting a community-based composting project. So if you're interested, check it out there. Uh, this webinar series is being brought to you through our involvement with the Million Acre Challenge, of which ILSR is a founding member. The Million Acre Challenge is a collaborative project that is supporting farmers in implementing healthy soils practices and regenerative agriculture on 1 million acres of farmland in Maryland and the Chesapeake region by 2030. Healthy soils, uh, healthy soils practices, including the skillful production and use of compost on farms, uh, have tremendous potential to improve farm resilience and profitability while also providing critical ecosystem services at a crucial time for our farms and our planet. To learn more about this project, check out their website. And now uh, let's get to know each other with a few interactive polls. Alrighty, so first question, where are you participating from? Select one of the following, Northeastern US, Southern US, Midwestern US, Western US, or outside the US? And let's see the results. So, as usual, majority from the northeastern U.S., but we got a good showing from the midwestern U.S., um, and even good representation from other parts of the U.S. and outside. So, welcome to everyone. Uh, let's go to the next poll. What best describes your affiliation? select one of the following. Are you a farmer, a composter, uh, someone who represents a government? Uh, are you a researcher, farm service provider, or a nonprofit? Or are you an, uh, a different business? Just a few more seconds. 
All right, let's check it out. It's a very nice even mix of farmer composter, a little head, uh, a lead to the government folks, and a researcher, farm service provider, and nonprofit. I know that's a big category, and other business. So welcome to you all. And the final poll that we'll do. Are you currently involved in composting or supporting composting in your work? And the second answer is supposed to be no, not now. Okay, just a couple more seconds. Great, let's check it out. So vast majority are already either composting or involved with composting. So welcome to you all. And for those that are not currently doing it, uh, hopefully this presentation will inspire you to, to get involved. Awesome, thanks, Megan. So um, now uh, as we hand over controls to our first presenter, uh, a few housekeeping notes. Um, everyone is in listen only mode. Uh, we will have time uh, at the end of both presentations for questions, uh, but go ahead and enter any questions you have as they come up in the GoToWebinar control panel box on your screen. This webinar is being recorded and a copy will be sent to you within the next day or so, so no worries there. But now it's my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Florian Amlinger. He is an agro agronomist and engineering consultant at Compost Consulting and Design in Austria. He's contributed to Austria's decentralized network of 350 or more composting facilities through applied research and the development of organic source separation and composting systems in various communities, including in rural areas that depend on farms. Florian coordinated the technical specification in Austria's compost ordinance and represents Austria and the Austrian Compost and Biogas Association in European collaborations. So welcome, Florian. Take, take us away. So, Linda, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me now. If not, just make a remark or give me a sign. Because Sounds it good. is uh, very good. It asked me for a new hardware here there, but I will click it off here. And so off we go. Um, I'm very happy to be with you. I would Lara like to be together live with you best way on a composting plant or on a farm where we can do the work together. Um, there is a philosopher uh, uh, from the last century and he said a very nice little sentence that the experience of the I, of myself, is only possible in the encountering the you. So encountering the world, if it is a human being, if it is the nature or some part of the nature, or if it is the soil maybe, if it is a compost heap, it is a personal getting, personal getting involved really with my knowledge, with all my biography, with all my skills, with all my feelings and my emotions, with all I have learned in my life uh, in a never-ending learning process. As you know, um, in organic farming, uh, in the very beginning of the uh, installation or founding of the International Federation of the Organic Farming Movement, IFRAM, they implemented this famous sentence, healthy soil means healthy plants means healthy animals and healthy men. Well, then it took us some time and still takes our time to define what is health, really. And we more and more come to the conclusion that it's a very volatile, very dynamic status, um, uh, depending on the circumstances that change from second to second, from minute to minute. So it is a balance we have to achieve. And soil fertility is a, a constant work 
to keep the balance on a level in the soil, in the soil plant system that is providing fertility and health to the entire ecosystem we are part of it. Um, and then I come to a, another citation from Johann Wolfgang Goethe. I'm sorry, I don't have uh, a citation from, um, from American authors here. <laughs> Uh, but he says, this is a translation of myself, but <laughs> that's not the good one. But the meaning is, as long as you don't have understood uh, the relationship or the dynamic between death and creation, death and growth, death and birth, you're just a dull guest on the dark earth. And this is all about, this is these big microbiological, microbio, microvirome dynamic we are living in, we have been developing out in our evolution that we have to understand deeper and deeper how we are connected. And what this is all about is what we see here. It is the garden, it is the paradise that feeds us. And it feeds us because there is a miracle. There's a miracle that's deep under our feet they are the rocks. And what is the main property in relation to what we see as a green entity on the top? It is dead. Yeah. It doesn't create on its own what we call life, what we call development due to the laws which are, you know, introduced into the substance itself. And how does it come that such a, you know, plant on the top. I didn't bring my carrot from the garden now. <laughs> How does it come that on, on the mineral ground of our earth, such a beautiful uh, empire of plants uh, that is nourishing us can evolve? How does it work? So there must be something that is transforming the dead rock, the sand, the desert, into something which is very close to life. And this miracle is mainly, can be named by a key word, and this is symbiosis. And this is a symbiosis between the plant and the mineral empire below the soil. And that is what is in between, and that is soil, and this is a habitat for the microbiome, the soil microbiome. Symbiosis is everything. And the plant with the plant exudate nourishes the microbiome in the root sphere by, you know, giving the assimilates, the phytosynthesis products directly into the soil to feed the, the symbiotic microorganisms in their environment in order to get them as part of their organ, of the plant organ, as we can name the soil as an organ of the plant, to deliver the minerals and the mineral compounds to nourish again the plant. It's a big, you know, wonder, miracle of symbiosis and interaction, as we know master of symbiosis just uh, symbolizing this picture and i say this only because this fungal and bacterial life in soil boosts life on earth tremendously yeah? plants may absorb just as one example 16 times more water and nutrients with the help of the fungal web in the soil full stop it's just one small indication. There's much more to say about what has been found out, out in the recent years. And the key is that these habitat, this environment of the plant is this clay humus complex. And now the, I come to the agricultural composting or the cooperation of the on-farm composting, that this processes in the soil and the idea 
the ideas behind creating, maintaining, building up, enhancing soil fertility must be understood by heart, intimately, uh, by the farmers who are responsible for the soil for their grandchildren. This is all they have to do. Soil is a commons, it's not private property. No square meter, no square yard of soil belong to anybody. It belongs to everybody in order to preserve life on earth. It's a very simple attitude. And what we are, have to take care about is this humification dynamic in the soil. This is one example from a long-term experiment in Europe showing that aggregate stability by using composted manure over 21 years increases the aggregate stability against you know conventional soil management tremendously and there's also one thing one motivation i want to mention <clears throat> they have found out that we have to eat 24 apples to to uh, receive the same amount for instance of uh, iron um, compared to 1914 where it was only necessary for the same amount to eat one apple. So something went wrong in terms of degradation of the quality of food. So humus management, soil fertility management is a matter of food safety. And therefore, what we need is education, education, education. And it is education to, from the gardeners who are responsible for, you know, self-reliant gardens and food provision for the families and the communities. Learning all about the different processes from bokashi, biochar, composting and the composting process itself or possibility of variations which are part of our natural bio, I would say, uh, biosymbiosis in our environment and with farmers. Because the farmers are the professionals here. And the concept in Austria was from the very beginning in all provinces. In 1980s, every village is composting farmer in order to close the organic cycle village by village city by city but therefore the farmers have to be motivated have to understand the maintenance and how to take care about the organic fertility of their of their soil with the help of compost of the recycled organic matter they have to understand what can go wrong in terms of drying out and uh, composting process. They have to understand what kind of materials they have, how to mix it in the right way, to understand that humus formation on soil and in the natural environment, in the savanna, in the woods, uh, on arable land is not the same as in a composting heap. It is an imitation of this process, but it is not the same. They have to learn exactly what time of shredder material they need depending on the type of body material they have available the machines have to develop in a way that the structure the size the particle size and the shredding properties are perfect for composting specifically to create the right surfaces for the microbiota so training 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 uh, and to get specifically the hands-on and I show you only those figures what we in Austria in these training programs. Um, we have approximately 280 farmers running composting plants out of 400 composting plants in total. I will show you the figures later. We tell them something which is very important. And this is a teaching from my experience since, since the 1980s. This is key what I've understood of soil formation. There is no stable humus formation without clay. In a pure silicate, sandy 
situation, sand, desert situation, without clay formation, you will never achieve a stable humus layer. Never, ever. Yeah. So you need clay compounds during the composting process to stabilize the clay humus complexes you produce. And then we train them even a little bit about indicators they can easily test on farm in order to have an idea, not only by organoleptic observation, but also by some very simple tests on the nitrogen cycle, on pH, on sulfate, etc. And also crest tests I will show you later, in order to see uh, the stage of maturation that is very important to achieve a compost that contributes best possible to humus buildup in the soil. So this is crest test that is done or with other plants also that is done routinely with the farmers and also this dilution test with just with distilled water where you can see from the density from um, the transparency and also from the colors, the maturity of your compost and the performance of your composting facility. It's just a little bit of training for a proper interpretation. And then at the very end, what you see here on the top, I can show you here. I guess this is the right one. Uh, uh, what you see on the top here is the uh, Composca and the quality seal, the quality certification for composting plants, um, and the, some minimum uh, criteria they have to achieve in order to participate, uh, to be awarded for the certification. And what is, sorry, 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 sorry. Now it's going on. Now I come to collection. What is very important if you receive not only green waste and manure from the environment, but also kitchen waste and you know from households and from restaurants, is the issue of impurities. Big problems in cities, but it very much depends on the collection scheme. So in the best performing on-farm composting corporations, where also the farmers do the collection service for the municipalities, they achieve a purity or a contamination of only 1.2%. If they do it in a way, I will show you in a minute. And this success story, where you have nearly nothing left because you have educated household by household in the schools, in the households, in the commercial entities, etc., providing the right equipment, you achieve very, very high purity because what you see here is a big problem. Even if you screen it, you will have impurities and your compost market might be destroyed at once. So all of our uh, citizens receive these little vented buckets. Ramon will tell you maybe about this also later. This is standard in well-performing uh, circumstances or situations all over Europe. Paper bags, biodegradable bags, which are certified by a European standard. For garden waste, the bigger paper bags, um, where you can put uh, the grass and, and clippings and some leaves, etc., and flowers. And it is collected by farmers in the rural environment in this way, for instance. Uh, depending on the size of the household, the buckets are bigger or smaller. But every bucket, bu bucket has a name and is identified. Even the biodegradable bags in some areas are identified with a number. So if there are a lot of impurities, plastics and some forks and metals and so included, not well separated, they can identify the household and contact him and tell him, you're not committed in the way we need it. You're part of our society and Please take care. With bigger facilities, with pickup systems, um, hydraulic systems. So, depending on the size, 
and uh, the catchment area the collection system is different. Here we have a, a example of a, a city of Graz with more than 300,000 inhabitants and they decided to do a centralized collection prepare and purify the collected biowaste, kitchen waste and garden waste in a central treatment facility, put it on a truck and send it to 18 different compost, agricultural composting plants to farmers in the environment uh, maximum 80 kilometers, in average 30 kilometers, 10 to 30 kilometers in the vicinity, in the environment of the city. So there is no central pit uh composting plant but 18 on farm composting plants and when the compost is tested for the standard quality criteria like heavy metals etc and everything is okay the farmer takes over the compost for his own use or he can also sell the compost to whomever he likes so it is a win-win situation for the city for the municipality and for the farmer Yes, this is the typical uh, garden waste collection. And then we have collection points, not uh, the distance between the settlements and these collection points should not be more than five kilometers. So, and in a mostly connected with a recycling center, this is a public amenity site where people pass by frequently, uh, easy to access with a separation of fine and bulky garden waste so that bulky garden waste can be shredded and it's mostly uh, can be delivered for free so the system yeah and now i show you typical composting plants on farm composting plants from very small um uh, one windrow alongside uh, the field alongside the road in the countryside where he goes with the windrow turner alongside the little road here on the upper left side, uh, it is composting between 300 and 10,000 cubic meter, depending on the catchment area and the municipality involved. Um, most of the facilities yeah, can have to be built on a paved area. I will show you later uh, details on, on this. Uh, exactly, this is an overview of a uh, design of a composting plant uh, where you have hopped rotter there. This is the main rotting area on the top. This is sealed, this is paved. The surface water is collected into the wastewater retention tank that is to be calculated according to the participation and the rainfall seasons in agreement with uh, the um, local authorities and the experts from the licensing bodies. And all facilities must be licensed as any even commercial waste treatment facility under the uh, specific regulations and guidelines, national guidelines for composting in Austria. Though there is no difference if you are a farmer or a commercial entity or industrial farm, you have to follow the same rules in terms of environmental protection. And then the open, uh, the, the, the post rotting or the maturation can be done on open ground. There is no need for sealing. And the definition for uh, the maturation phase is that the compost must um, achieve or maintain a temperature below 40 to 45 degrees Celsius on a constant level. And then you can put it on the open ground or even beside your acre or your field where you uh, finish your composting for the final period in maturation. So this is also what those farms look like. Typically, yeah, wastewater collection with those little gullies. Uh, uh yeah and i i uh, swiftly give an overview of what is needed in terms of um regulatory framework in order to establish even this decentralized on-farm corporation 
first of all, in order to make the entire system of separate collection and composting successful, you need an obligation of binding targets for salt separation. Uh, this has been established already in the early 90s in Austria. And then it starts the education how this must be done in order to achieve uh, at the end a high quality compost. So high quality feedstock means high quality compost uh, in order to give time and, and skills and knowledge to set up the right collection scheme. Um, in, in parallel, we have a ban on biodegradables of landfills so that all source separated organics are directed towards biological treatment. And then it is important to give compost a name. A name is a product. That means in Austria, we were the first country or EU member state establishing a so called end of waste quality standards within a decree within an ordinance that defines the illegible feedstock, feedstock quality, plus minimum requirements for you know time temperature regime, hygienization, sanitization, plus the definition of quality criteria for compost to seize the waste status to become a compost product to be freely marketed and put on the marketplace. And therefore, this was an enormous achievement to say, this is a product as a fertilizer, as a soil improver, as a constituent for growing media that can compete with all other fertilizers, growing media and, and soil improver. Uh, the next one is we need technical standards, common technical standards for design and for operation of composting plants. That's very important, not to be too strict and not to overrule with too, you know, scary <laughs> and, and, and strict and stringent requirements regarding environmental requirements. We can discuss this perhaps later, what I mean with this. This is about order control, this is about water protection, etc. cetera, um, where if you, if you make a good job, you can be quite relaxed with uh, composting activities. Um, economic drivers, incentives, this is mainly an issue uh, to make separate collection, give incentive for separate collection and make residual waste expensive, but this is not so much our topic here. Um, and also, of course, to maybe give some support, which was done in the in the beginning and now by the EU for establishing decentralized on-farm composting systems where provinces and also national governments and municipalities gave uh, subsidies for the investment up to 50% for the investment for building and construction of the composting plants. Uh, and finally, the quality assurance and certification scheme we have established since the very beginning. Here, uh, the development uh, from the 1990s to today, and you will wonder, uh, in, in 1992, these uh, obligation for separate collection of organic waste was established. From that on, the municipalities and waste management associations started the initiatives so there's a big increase in the next uh, three to four years. And then constantly more and more was uh, produced uh, in terms of, of uh, quantity of bio waste collected. And you see a miracle in from 2017 to 2019. This is because uh, we established a, a national uh, um, regulation for waste reporting for and electronic data management and waste reporting. Now we have really good data. <laughs> the data, the, 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 really, the reality of separate collection, specifically of, um, uh, of green waste, et cetera, jumped into the statistics. <laughs> so from 2017 to 2019, it, it went up from approximately 1 million to 1.6 million tons we are collecting. Uh, I didn't mention that we have a, approximately 8 million inhabitants 
in Austria so that you have that relation at the moment. <clears throat> and you can uh, achieve a picture of our decentralized system that we have for these 8 million uh, residents as inhabitants, 400 composting plants. Um, that means the average um, uh, treating approximately 1.3 million tons uh, and including some sewage sludge here. And this is in total 145 kilograms per inhabitant. That is factually yeah, composted. That's a very high number, actually. And uh, nearly 70% are members in the quality assurance scheme. And now is something very important that our um, the novelation, the new composting um, ordinance that will be enact enacted next year, will make the quality assurance and certification scheme, including intensive education and certification, obligatory. So the 70% from next year or in two years' time, will be 100%. So those composting facilities, all farms will be visited every year by an inspector. And by this, they receive training and improvement year by year, year by year. And uh, this is a very important tool to integrate this intensive communication, controlling and inspection work. And it creates also confidence uh, among uh, among the society, among the authorities, uh, but also for the population. And you see our small scale composting plants. In average, we have uh, here uh, 3,000 tons per, um, per plant. Uh, in the top of Austria, or in the center of Austria, there's one province. Uh, they established approximately 160 composting plants for 1.4 million inhabitants in a very rural area. So there, it has been realized what I mentioned before, every city, every village, every town, one or two farmers yeah, doing the job of separate collection and composting. This is the most transparent uh, and uh, way to do it because every citizen knows exactly where the compost is produced, the quality and where he received his compost for his garden again. So, but the participation in separate collection depends very much first on public relation work, on the rollout system of the bio bin, of the brown bin, but also on, of course, the settlement structure, more rural. So we have different pros, uh, more, if it's more rural or more urban areas, so we have quite a difference between different provinces, but one of the provinces, uh, the, the far right one, with 10% participation, in fact, is the province that we would say is a white spot in Austria. So I have still a lot to do there. You see the same, it is Carinthia. This is the quantity and the specific quantity collected here in 2017, kilogram per inhabitant and year. And you see, uh, Carinthia here, the, the second left, only 50 kilogram per inhabitant. Uh, if you compare it with others, up to 117, some other provinces. But in some districts, the quantity goes up to 200, 300 kilogram per inhabitant. There's a huge potential still available in spite we have started in the late 80s. And what is now very important is again, uh, coming back to education or to minimum requirements is that uh, there is a strict rule that if you have to mix in a certain amount of bulky shredded wood waste into kitchen waste or into sewage sludge. So this is um, a very, you know, a, 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 an element of quality assurance that has been put up first as a, as a guideline and in due time next year, it will be an obligation for the license. And you prevent uh, mismanagement, all the problems and failures on composting plant if you strictly require a certain minimum requirement for the initial mix of the feedstock that you have enough 
carbon rich material. And this becomes important also in terms of understanding the composting process from the very beginning, uh, identifying the right composition of feedstock. And another issue that we have a minimum requirement because all our facilities, or most of them, yeah, 95% of our facilities are open windflow uh, composting plants, that we want to prevent these, you know, four meter high. Uh, table mountains and uh, provide minimum requirements for the relation between size of the wind row and minimum requirements for turning and aeration. So, feedstock mix, um, uh, limiting the size of the wind rows plus turning and aeration as minimum requirements. And if this is already not only in a guideline, but in a binding, you know, setup, binding uh, component element in the national licensing procedure, it is also educating the authorities and the experts in the authorities and in the local governments. And this is another very important message that education is needed for all involved parties, not only for the composting plant operators and between the experts. No. It, you have to take on board the local government and the uh, representative of the authorities which are involved in the licensing and in the control. And this is just a scheme of the uh, quality assurance system where all um, composting plants, and this was very important for the farmers, are obliged to be members. Um, so they have one person visiting them, taking the samples, uh, um, providing the report from the accredited laboratory, and there is an uh, independent committee that would speak out and award the certificate year by year. So every composting plant receives such a certificate uh, he can use for his marketing and it is well known and accepted by all uh, professional users and in the market. That's another example how this is done uh, on a European level also. There's a intensive cooperation with the European Compost Network. And we are personally in our institute, we also provide international certification for countries who do not have the infrastructure for certification of compost. And every second year, there is a big fiesta, a big celebration where the best 10 composting composts are awarded with the so called Composca uh, that are tested uh, for the parameters I showed you before, or you will see them when you receive the presentation. And finally, but finally, education internationally. I don't know, I've, I'm used all my time, more than my time, I guess, already. <laughs> um, uh, you see, uh, after the Corona and COVID break, I'm happy to offer again this autumn in September, an international one week uh, training, uh, uh, and, uh, and training and study tour in Austria where we try to show you the details um, uh, of the composting separate collection scheme specifically in the, the decentralized model which is quite unique in Europe and I would say worldwide but I'm very happy <laughs> it's not worldwide anymore that we have it uh, with Ramon's activities and his friends and um, I'm very happy to see and hear your efforts in the US. I would be more than happy to visit once in the near future. All right, thank you very much. If you want to hear more about uh, this, this seminar and this uh, excursion in September, I will put you in my address list and send you the information. Thank you so much, and I'm looking forward for our discussion.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Florian, uh, for that great presentation. Um, and uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to save uh, the questions for the very end. I'd like to make sure we have time for Ramon's presentation, though we do have a, a few good questions. Uh, please keep them coming if you have them. Um, but now as we hand uh, controls over to Ramon, uh, I will go ahead and introduce him. So Ramon Plana uh, holds a PhD in biology and industrial composting and is an international consultant with Maestro Compostador. Uh, he has worked with private and public entities around the world to advance research, design, and impl implementation projects for the management and treatment of a variety of organic wastes. He holds several patents for the treatment of organic waste through aerobic and anaerobic biological processes and regularly collaborates with the Association of Cities and Regions for Sustainable Resource Management. So take us away, Ramon. Okay, hello there, hello everyone. Just a second, okay. I think that you are seeing my screen now. So, <clears throat> hello everyone, thank you very much to the ELS for the invitation to to be part of the of this webinar and uh, I think that now you are going to understand why at the beginning I asked to to Linda that Florian has to talk before me because what we are going to to show you what I'm going to present you is a much more modest uh, implementation of the fan composting of the decentralized composting model related to to funds and the first step that we are developing here in Spain. So that's either just you have it, you want to know who I am. <clears throat> here in Spain we are uh, defending that the bio waste management should have three models or three <clears throat> first uh, approaches. <clears throat> the model without collection of the food waste is the transportation the models were, okay, there is a collection, but the transportation is minimum. You don't go very far from the town, from the village, from the city. And the centralized models that are based on collection and transportation to big facilities, to big uh, plants, treatment plants. The first two models, we think that can be done with very simple and economical technology, low cost, low tech system. But as Florian uh, said, we need a very clean bio waste with very low content in contaminants of improperties. Those systems are low tech because we need people. So we are going to rise the employment rates in the area. We, we change equipments for jobs. They are effective if we do it well. It allows to reach successful results and we have many to present. And what we think that is more important is that involved citizens because people are going to see in front of them what is happening with their waste, especially with the food waste, with the kitchen waste, and what it means, the quantities, what it means where they do not separate it well, and the possibilities to transform that waste into a resource. So at the end, the territory is also involved in the management. Moreover, we can't involve local companies, small companies, small and medium companies, and even those companies with social enterprises that allow that uh, people in risk of social exclusion could perform specific tasks that are related in one way or another with the composting, with the local composting. So we think that with this system you can develop a real local economy, circular economy, based in the treatment of the kitchen waste or, and other kinds of uh, organic wastes. The centralized models that uh, we are looking for, big facilities with high technology that allow us to treat food waste or, or any other kind of organic waste with a lot of contaminants. Uh, we don't care too much for the collection systems. They are automatic, most of, most of, the, of the systems, so the employment rate is much lower than in the others. The results are mixed in the meaning that uh, in some cases we have very good results and they, those uh, facilities produce a relatively good uh, product, but in others it's a complete disaster. And 
uh, their distance to the people. I mean that people do not care about what happens with the waste. They only care for the container that they have uh, in front of their house or not far from, from their house, that it has to be empty every night. That's just what they, they care for. So with that in mind, now we are going to, to travel from the U.S. to Spain. I chose Detroit because it was the first uh, city I visited when the first time I went to, to the U.S. And we are going to the north of Spain, to the city of Bilbao. And here I, we are going to present you the first uh, examples. But before that, just a few, few hints about Spain and our waste management uh, results. Okay. This is the, la the, the last results or the last uh, numbers we have about the municipal waste management. So as you can see, most of our, our municipal waste goes to landfill, directly to landfill. It is the same. And we have a lot of work to do to fulfill all the European directives about waste management. We are in the queue. And as you can see at the, at the left of the graph, for composting and aerobic digestion, we just uh, recovered three percent of the of the waste, of the municipal waste. Maybe you can if you can find in in some reports and some articles that the number is around 17. Why? Because they consider it that all the food waste that are mixed with the residual waste, so I mean those fractions that are not separate on source, and that go to mechanical biological treatment facilities. It's also composting, but in the real reality, uh, the quantity of food waste that is recovered separately, it's just the three percent. So, as I said, we have a lot of things to do in this in this country. About the distribution of population, it is interesting to understand what is happening here. You can see in this map of Spain the distribution of the population. And every spike you are seeing, there are points with a higher density than, than others. So you can see the main cities of Spain in the center. You can see this is the capital, Madrid. Here in the Mediterranean coast is Barcelona and all the municipalities around. The north this is Bilbao and other, other cities, San Sebastián. And this is Valencia. And you can see, okay, this is the big, all the capitals of the province of different states. In results, 50% of the population of Spain lives in 125 municipalities, and we have more than 8,000 municipalities in, in, in Spain. So, half of the, of the population of this country is distributed, it's dispersed in the countryside, and our waste management model is, in most of our, our region, is completely centralized. This is the number of MBTs facilities as I said before, this is with not separation of the food waste. You can see the, the, this bar is a comparison between different regions. As you see, most of them are in Barcelona, in Catalonia, in the south, in Andalusia, they are in then Madrid. If we talk about composting for food waste, for bio waste, you can see that there is a big difference, Catalonia and the rest. Why? Because here in Catalonia we have around 27 composting facilities for food waste. And in the rest of, uh, of Spain, this uh, is, uh, is an emptiness because in the north we have here, we have uh, we have two, now we have one in the Basque Country, we have uh, another one in, in Navarre, and now we are building two more. Madrid, they have just uh, one of it. Uh, here in my homeland, Galicia in the northwest, here we just have at this moment one that is operating. There are another that are private, but public, that is just one. So, as you can see, the difference is huge. What it means that if we're trying to compare the uh, centralized models and the centralized models, I did this this number according to the to the number of comp of composting facilities in different countries in Europe and the inhabitants. As you can see, Portugal it has a composting facility for every five million persons. Spain is one composting facility for every 1.5 million, but if we take out Catalonia, it, this number rise to more than three millions. One composting facility for every three million persons. At the bottom, Austria, as you have now listened to Florian and you can understand what I mean. 
uh, my numbers was around one composting facility for every 19 uh, inhabitants. Florian now update that data to 22,000. But as you can see, the big difference, okay, the different approach to the strategy of waste management, decentralized models confronting front, uh, centralized models like Spain. And talking about another uh, models like household composting, there are some areas in the north where there are many composters distributed in the in the households but uh, at the end not all of them have been really monitored so, so we don't really know if they're being uh, well managed or no if they are uh, processing all the food waste that is being generated in the household or not so this number has to be taken with couches and community composting okay here we have uh two regions that are the um, the main leaders at this moment, this is in the north, Basque Country was here, they were the, the pioneers in, in the meaning that uh, around 13, 14 years ago, we begin to experiment with different municipalities, with the different models that could be uh, implemented in, in, in their towns and villages. And nowadays, there are more than 500 community composting areas and 13 different models of community composting here. In the west, uh, this is the province of Pontevedra, this is where I was born, and here we, there is a, a, a model with a very um, in, intensive program about decentralized composting based on community composting. And nowadays, they are treating almost uh, 3,500 tons of food waste per year in community composting areas. And there are some areas in, in the in the east, in, in the community of, of Valencia, there are some initiatives. Navarre, uh, it's now also in the north, they, is, they are beginning with a very intensive project. And some areas of Catalonia, they have a, a very interesting development of community composting. In the rest, there are also there are other experience, but they are not alternatives, real alternatives to bio waste management. So they need to have a, a complementary system with the collection. So, this is the overview of Spain and our waste management model. And now I'm going to present you the different examples. We go to the north, La, La, La Rabechu. Uh, those were the pioneers in, in the farm composting in Spain. Here, this is a small uh, village of La Rabechu. It's close to, to Bilbao, around 20 kilometers far. It has uh, around 2,000 inhabitants. And as they were about 20 kilometers far from, from the big city in the area, it means that they have to pay for the collection taxes and the transportation costs uh, uh, higher prices than, than the neighbors because they were at the end of the valley, so the trucks have to go there, collect a few kilograms of food waste, and then come back to the big facility. So for this village, it means a, a lot of money. So in 2013, uh, some neighbors here begin to think that some other options could be available for them. And they have heard something about the Austrian model. Here in Spain, it's uh, you, you can some in some places you can you can listen that the that sentence, oh, we have to replicate the Austrian model, or you have to look for the Austrian model. So Florian so explained you what we think, what is the Austrian model. So they wanted to do something like that. They contacted me and we were thinking about which were the real possibilities for them to, to perform some kind of local composting based in the action of local farmers. So nowadays, you're going to see, we develop a, a system that they are being running during all these years that uh, at this moment involves 290 families, nine big producers, big producers, I mean, uh, shops, restaurants, um, fresh markets in the area. And they have at this moment three simple composting facilities that are managed by, by farmers. Uh, a few months ago, they were four, but now the, the, the one of the farmers uh, decided that he couldn't continue with, with, with the program. As you see, these composting areas, they are very, very simple. They were made by the by the neighbors and with recycled materials, all the boots that you can see here, they were recycled. And the system is very, very simple. It's based in, 
the three or four boxes that when one is full they have to move the material to the next and continue and as you can see this is more or less how it looks why we can do it like that florian also explained it we have a very very good quality of the food waste it has less than one percent of contaminants even we can think about less than 0.5 so it's extremely easy to treat it here you have uh, some videos where you can see how the, the system works okay so the food waste is generated in the households so they collect it in a very small bin then three days during the week they can take it out to the street to to the doors of the building or the house and then the the farmer the baserritarra is the the word in in the basque language collect it okay at the beginning they have just one one farmer and they they realized that it was impossible to keep the the service during the whole year so they look for other farmers to join the the program and at this moment as i say they are they are finished so they dis, they distribute when and how they they collect the the food waste every week in the composting facility they measure the quantity of the food waste by volume and they uh, just put it inside the inside the boxes they add the the bulky material that they have from their activity in the in the farm and from that the beginning the process begin as you know at the end they use farmers really want the compost for for the crop plants because the uh, the lands in, in that area are quite poor in fertility because of industrial activity that they had in in the area in the previous year and those vegetables are sold to the to the to the neighbors to the population so they, they close the, the cycle during these years uh, what they, they got is the as i said the uh, they they see that it was impossible to keep the the service if they don't have more than two or three farmers involved because any injured or the or the farmer got ill or he wants to take up a holidays a vacation anything they want to do they couldn't take the the population un, unattended so they begin to involve other farmers they begin to try with other system as i said they were the pioneers so they were experimenting a lot with these typical home composters for the first stages and then they move it to the next and one of the most interesting things here was that in 2015 one of the most important restaurants in spain one of with three michelin stars one of those restaurants that they give you uh a dish like this and the quantity of food is like this and the bill is three pages at least and have no less than two zeros so one of the restaurants joined the project and it was very very funny because here you have the composting area the, the first one and it's around less than a mile far from the from the uh, from the town from Larabechu, and the restaurant it's just here really really close to the composting area but they just wanted more and more food, uh, waste beans they didn't want to know nothing about compost until the moment that the town hall decide okay this is the bill for all the containers that you're asking for and if you don't want to pay it you have to take your food waste and go to the composting area and uh, put it there for to be processed and they wanted to say okay we will do it and moreover they begin to announce in the in the press and in their web their web page that they were making compost and at this moment uh, two years ago they got an international prize award related to the was the most sustainable restaurant in the world because they were performing composting and, and other things of course but uh, since that moment the pro here you can see this is the restaurant here at the bottom of the composting facility and since that moment the the project got more uh, strength and it was more respected uh, for the local authorities 
This is the quantities of uh, food waste that they are processing in, in, in this model. Okay, here in, in the yellow ones, you can see this is from the restaurant. This is the quantity from the restaurant. 2020, because of the COVID, the quantities was more, more smaller. As you can see, more or less they are processing 70 to a little more than 80 tons per, per year. They are quite uh, modest. This, these are, are the results from the analytics of the first uh, compost. They comprise all the exigencies that we have here in Spain for the for compost, and it has the highest legal quality related to the heavy metals content. It's class A, so here in Spain it will be available to using in organic farming. Pros and cons of this project, okay, it came from the citizens. It was very important because it gives you a, a, a high resistance and citizens convinced the authorities that it was good, that it was uh, it has a future. And at the end, all the mayors uh, accepted and, and, and bet the, that it could be a, a future for, for, the, for the town. It gives you a rent to the to the farmers, so they allow us to continue their activities. Families are encouraged to participate because they really know what happens with the wasted, and they know they are for good and not just for them, it's for all the population. It's simple, it's a very simple system, and they could incorporate new incentives in, in the area like social currency. Problems that as I said, they began in 2013. Now we are 10 years later, they are still with the same uh, model, so they have to improve it yet, and they will take it. They have to invest more money to, to get all the, um, all the efforts and all the permits that the authorities ask, the uh, regional authorities ask them to have. And they have a big dependence of the number of, of farmers. Okay. Now we go very not far from here in, in the north, in Surville. And here we have also the first uh, composting uh, facility that are really managed for, by a farmer. It is a, a bigger uh, town. And here we have we find household composting, community composting. And with the, for the families that do not perform one of those systems, they have door to door collection. And what they are doing now is they are taking part of that door to door collection and going to a farmer here where they receive two tons of bio waste every 15 days. So he's not under pressure, he can manage them with calm and do all the things that they have to be done to be sure that you have a good compost. They have a small turner machine that was also made in Spain. And the bulky material is, is provided by the municipality and also by the farmers. All the farmers were trained and they have a very specific protocol for the management of food waste. So when the truck arrives, they, they are prepared to, to process immediately all the food waste and build the windrow, perform the turnings and to keep it covered and under control at, at every moment. So all the parameters are monitored, but uh, not uh, at every moment, but yes, every day we have the register of temperatures, or, and if they have any any problem, they find or they sense any smell or anything, they uh, immediately take note and, and, and try to correct it. And before the use, the product is analyzed. So all authorities can have the, can be sure that we are not doing anything harmful for the environmental or for the final destination of the compost. We are still in the north. This is a project uh, that was financed, financed by the European Union and the government of Navarre that involved a social company that is called Josenea. We are here in the north. Here, Josenea is a, is a social company that uh, been uh, working for 20 years now and they produce organic uh, herbals, medicinal, medicinal herbals and teas and different kinds of uh, cosmetic products, all made by, by organic products uh, locally and the, the workers are always people at risk of social exclusion. So one of the problems that they had is what they didn't have enough compost for their harvest. So 
they begin to think uh, after some of our uh, meetings and speech in, in the university here in, in Navarre that maybe it could be possible that they uh, do perform the collection of food waste in their area and with that food waste they are going to produce compost for themselves. So they will have an economical income for the service that they offer to the to the uh, to the towns around the, their farm, the collection of the food waste and the treatment of the food waste, and they have also the benefit of the compost that they are going to produce for their, their use. So here you have it's a very simple composting facility. They perform the bio waste collection to for the local and they, they do the local treatment also with a very simple turner machine that was made locally with a black by a blacksmith in the town but also in this project we include the training so this this facility is also a school a school for training people as uh, master composters as people that uh, they, they they learn how what they have to do technically and administrative, administrative about the management of a composting facility. They also learn about the compost, how they can use it to, to test the quality of the compost, and also schools and universities go there to learn more about composting. Another point of this project is that the university is related with it in the research of different organic products that can be produced in the composting facility, not only compost by, by itself, be not a, a liquid uh, organic uh, fertilizers or different mixes of, of products, bio pesticides, etc. So there's also a research here and broadcasting. We are also we've been working a lot to promote this model to make people know about it. So we try to to make it more popular in in, in other areas of Spain. Last year we received an award from the Rural Inspiration Awards for Resilient F Futures, so we think that we were going in the right way here. Another example, now we're going to the to the islands, we go to Balearic Islands, and this is a project that connects tourists with ecology and local farming. We are in the Mallorca Island in the Mediterranean Sea. Here, okay, some de fast details. You see, you know, here the uh, the problem with organic matter in the soil in the Mediterranean basin is really, really terrible. We have most of our soils, more than 75% of our soils have less than 2% of organic matter. And we are even losing and losing that, those contents. For the island, we can see that specifically, they have six, more, almost 70% of the soils have an erosion risk and they are losing almost 12 tons of soil per hectare and per year in the island. So they need organic matter. Moreover, they almost they don't have cattle, so it's hard for them to get the organic matter that they need to, to, to produce compost. But what they have is a lot of tourists. Okay, 2020 they have a, a drastic reduction of the number of tourists, but now they rise again when they have even more than before. So it means that they have a high demand for local resources and a high waste generation. And this hotel company, Garden Hotels, that has been working in the island for more than 30 years. And this man, Homer Dean, has begun to think, okay, maybe we can do something about waste management and organic matter and soils so what they did is okay we want to offer to our customers organic i want to pass this video and we'll give you later they want to give you to the to our customers to our client, clients organic products but they have to be local we want local organic products and they, they didn't find it in, in the market so what they did is okay we have we are producing more than 100 tons of food waste per year in just in one of our one of our hotels so they take it during, during one month, October of 2016, we take it to a farm uh, managed by people as, also in risk of social exclusion. We teach them how to make compost. And during this year, that, uh, the last month of that year, they produce organic compost that they gave, gave to the Association of Organic Farmers of the island. And with that compost, they produce organic products for the hotel. 
during this pro this pilot project we take them all the politicians all the technicians from the local government so they can see they can touch they can smell and they can see that it was possible it was real and with that we could begin the real project in september 2019 so nowadays two of those restaurants and the bigger two of these hotels and the bigger restaurants in the island the hotel collect the food waste from those uh, those places and they take it to a uh, organic farm in the island that is not far that 15 kilometers from the hotels and here we have a very small composting facility very simple we we train the people in the farm how to make compost and they take all the measure all the controls we have everything under control at every moment to be sure that they are managed the food waste correctly and the farmer gives the hotel organic products by the value of the organic matter that they receive. There is no money exchange here, only products. The farmer receives organic matter and the farmer gives organic products by the value of the organic matter. And until now, we have processed more than 400 tons of food waste during this year and the content in contaminants now is around 0.15 percent so it's really really good material to be processed in these simple systems the process as i said is monitored and all the data are collected and uploaded to the cloud so we can see immediately what is happening and we have our, all the process under control this project has received different awards in the in the last year and the hotel is very happy because at the end this is publicity for them so they don't they don't care for the investment in the project because at the end it have the the return of a very good image it's always in the press and they create jobs one of them for people of social exclusion we have developed some machinery in the island so nowadays they know how to make this this kind of machinery that we don't have it before and also the hotel create a new company for the management of green waste of the island to produce the bulky material that they need for for the compost so the main challenge we had during this, this time was to convince the local administration as florian said this is one of the challenges and one of the specific uh, targets of these kind of projects they become official waste manager manager it was difficult but they they did it now they as i said they know how to produce their own bulky material we don't have providers for the machinery in the island and at, at the end now we can't build it in the island so the things are changing now in in balearic islands related to to this kind of projects and Ramon, i just want to yes? flag that we just have a few more minutes so that we can leave uh time for questions okay so this was the last example. This is the in Canary Islands. And just to point you, this is a, an island with a very difficult orography, the high mountains, volcanoes, etc. And all the all the organic wastes are were managed here in just one point of the island. And now we perform a project where there is a lot of decentralized composting all around the island, and we are planning to use two composting facilities that they already exist for the treatment of agricultural wastes from bananas mainly so they can't uh, now include also food waste from local uh, village local small village and towns in the area so this is one of the projects we are, we are working with to finish it uh, the pro the problems with the with this model is that there is not a specific regulation in Spain for this scale so it depends on the interpretation for every uh, responsible from the technical or the public administration uh, only in Navarre they perform uh, because of the project of Josenea they develop a first regulation that is based in administrative and technical conditions okay you have it here so we make it simple to to can build and perform these facilities our main problem here is the quality of the food waste because in some cases we don't know who is going to control the food waste that the facility receives and who is going to pay if the farmer has to invest more money or more equipment 
and have a, a loss of the quality of the compost. So here, this is a problem now in Spain when we try to promote this kind of models. And the need of professional technical training, that uh, it is essential as, as Florian previously said. Okay, We know that farmers know about composting, but this is a little bit different and more intense. Supervision external technical support, also Florian explained it about it. This, uh, here is a, very, a research group in the University of, uh, uh, of Miguel Hernandez in, in, in Valencia that they are doing a very amazing job, work about it, uh, the training and the giving uh, assistance to the farmers. And to guarantee that the process is, or the process, the service is given during the whole year. So this is also one of the cons that the model has. So it is important to consider it. Finally, just to comment that it's important that the Eureka sector can be the, all, the, uh, the best allies. Restaurants, hotels, canteens, cafeterias, they, create, they generate a lot of food waste and very clean food waste. So it's very easy to transform it into a compost in, in a local model. So as I said, this is a, the key aspect for, for the model, here, at, at least here at this moment in Spain, the specific regulation that we missed, the guarantees of the quality of the food waste, the technical training, technical support, external support, service guarantees, and the synergies that we can create with the RECA sector. Just to finish, uh, our association that's called Fertility Auro has created, has developed uh, a community composting uh, guide, a handbook, to promote the model and it has been translated to different languages, it is in English if you want it, and also to the to Bolivia and other areas. We also perform, as a friend said, training courses just for looking for that, so farmers and other people could be trained, and also those kind of tours to show people, to show politicians, technicians from other countries and also other parts of Spain that those models are, are a reality, but what they need to do, what they need to know to take them to their countries, to their, uh, to their regions and to really implement it. So that's all. I'm sorry if I took longer than I, than I thought, but I hope it will be interesting for you. Thank you very much for your attention and any questions here you have me. Fabulous. That was a great presentation. Thank you, Ramon. Um, and so now we're going to move into uh, questions and answers. And uh, I just love the combination of um, your presentations. Um, I think the gold standard in Austria, what this could look like. And I love uh, seeing in Spain, which I think is probably more similar to where we are in the United States, of of something a little bit uh, where we're still striving for that gold standard. So thank you for, for that. And uh, I loved seeing the, I think your presentations both clearly illustrated the benefits of community scaled composting solutions that can really be adapted to the local conditions and local challenges and local communities, but also some of the considerations and challenges at that scale and the importance of um, support um, for the farmer, for uh, in you know implementing the composting, but then also for uh, educating the community on how to participate. So uh, such great presentations. Uh, one of the questions that I think we could pose to both of you, um, you both mentioned the importance of um, um, contamination or just the needing a clean stream that will be composted at this scale, and uh, the question from a participant was, what is an acceptable amount of contamination? And uh, for customers or people uh, submitting their uh, food scraps to be composted in these projects, uh, what are the consequences if they exceed the limits? So, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, very good. So, uh, if you allow, I can. Uh, start with that because we have, after now 30 years of experience, again a very big discussion there. Um, uh, we are going to implement a, a minimum requirement, so a limit, with 2% um, by weight. 
of impurities of contaminants uh, that is allowed to enter the composting heap. And there is another threshold that they consider now 5% by, by weight um, that can enter the composting facility, but then you have to introduce a purification and separation equipment yeah, to take the impurities out. But there's a, a, actually <laughs> who will pay for it, who will analyze it if it's 5.2 or 2.3 or whatever. <laughs> Uh, so it's it's really tricky. So the only thing you can do, you can, you, you, um, and that what was very very successful in our case is to uh, achieve the commitment by the by the entities who are responsible for the collection. That might be the municipality, that might be the inter-community association. So the waste management association of uh, a number of municipalities. That might be a private company, but at the end, the private company is contracted by the municipality or by a local authority. And in the bylaws of the contract, it must be clearly stated that they have to take into account, to, to take care about the proper education and the control of the bins they collect. So they have to pri provide a system how they do the controlling and the communication about the purity and the quality of the feedstock and the food waste they collect. And I think this again starts with a very intensive corporate um, um, communication and identification with the system. And then you might succeed. Um, you ask for the threshold that would be acceptable at the end. I'm telling you it's 1%. It's one percent. We sh we shouldn't be shamed to be quite stringent and very clear about it, because five percent, which you will find in some of the areas in 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 the big cities, for instance, it looked like, it looks like hell because it's mainly plastic, and five percent by by uh, by weight is uh, even in the final product you will have these fine plastic pieces which are. Uh, end up in microplastic, which is the big debate today. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I absolutely agree with, with Florian. More than 2% becomes a problem in, in this kind of facilities. It's so simple because if not, you have to invest in equipment or you have to invest in time of your, of your workers, open the bags by hand, <clears throat> taking out the plastics. So it's uh, at the end that's impossible or it means that you have to invest a lot of money for the management yeah. of the yeah. facility. So as Florian said, less than one percent <clears throat> is the objective here, target here. But the yes. problem, of course, is at the end who is responsible for those qualities. So that's what I said at the beginning the Oreca sector, the hotels, restaurants, something like that that is very very easy, quite easy. To have it under control, to teach the people in the kitchen, in, in the halls, how they have to separate it, the food, then it's very easy to have an important quantity of food waste that is almost completely clean. So I'm beginning with that. And then begin to train to, to raise the awareness of the people, of the citizens, of the politicians, of the local administration, of, of the importance of the, of the separation on source. So, and then you can go, you can try to get. A, a very a, a good quality food waste, and then you can think, okay, now I can I can extend the model to more facilities or to do this facility a, a bit a little bit uh, higher, bigger. Sorry. Yes, great answers. Uh, the importance of of models, uh, pilots that can, that can be scaled up uh, once the systems are dialed in. Um, so I'm just flagging that it's almost 1.30. I'm wondering if you, uh, Ramon and Florian, would be willing to stay on for just a few more minutes to answer some more questions? Yes, definitely. No problem at all. Fabulous, okay. So uh, one question uh, directed at you, Florian, I think was for an urban area, um, did you, in your the exam, one of the examples you gave uh, was the material sort of collected at a central area where contamination was removed, and then it was sent on to farmers who would compost it? Or are there also examples where the farmers have to decontaminate? 
Um, but it, it's always both because the decontamination in a central facility in the city is uh, uh, never complete. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so if you collect from a city, we have the problem that we might be in the range of 2% and then they have some screening and some separation by ballistic separation and separation by wind sifter, by separation by uh, a magnetic separator, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but at the end, um, uh, we had those problems that the, the mixed and prepared feedstock delivered to the farmers still was quite contaminated. But this is also due to the fact that there was not a much, not enough commitment by the city, by the municipality and its co-workers to do more about education work to the household and to, to put more effort uh, in, even in the, in the cleaning and purification and separation activities. But at the end, it was the res it is the responsibility of the central of the municipality and the facility to deliver uh, a well a well prepared uh, raw feedstock mix to the farmers. Great, thank you for that clarification. Uh, now, question for you, Ramon. Um, someone asked: Is there any competition between composters and pig farmers? or other animal farmers, I suppose, to participate in the composting model, models that no, you've unfortunately, mentioned? Unfortunately not. Uh, it's really hard to find uh, some farmers uh, at this moment that they want to be involved in this kind of, in this kind of models. Uh, we have found in, in some cases that they, they really want the compost, but when you say, okay, but you have to do it by yourself and we are you are going to collect or you are going to receive the the food waste and then you have to transform it into compost and they say no 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 it's, i don't have time uh, it's more complicated uh, it's going to be uh, i have i going to have a lot of controls from the administration i don't want to to have problems in at this moment for example in in pontevedra in, in that province that i said they have a very intense program in, in community composting now the, cover, the provincial government has developed a project uh, to uh, give uh, some kind of help, economical help to any uh, farmer or association of farmers that will, that will that could will to collect or receive organic waste from municipalities uh, around them. So they want to, to to give money for the investment in the facility or in the collection system and try to promote this model because they they tried it years ago and they didn't find any farmer interested in, in that so it's difficult hearing uh, most of the farmers are are still related to the mineral fertilizers and um, it's now it's this year with the crisis in, in energy crisis with the in, tremendous rise of the cost of the fertilizers that a lot of them now they are looking for organic uh, fertilizers and they try to to find uh, other sources but until now mm, you do, you have to to take a lot of time to to knock a lot of doors to find uh, farmers that could be interested in, in the model yes uh, uh the current crisis um with uh prices of a lot of commodities but including um, fertilizers is uh, something we feel he even here in the US um, it's an, very important but hopefully it also brings us back to the importance of um, and opportunities with um, compost as uh, an amendment that can also reduce the need for uh, fertilizers uh, synthetic fertilizers that's a great point um, so a question that this also leads me to is um, how do you balance supporting farmers to to get involved with this without making it feel like they're being forced or um, by putting too much of the onus of uh, the responsibility of managing all of the different pieces of collecting the waste and processing the waste and then distributing the compost at the end. Uh, maybe this is a question more for 
for uh, Florian, because I think Ramon, you sort of touched on it, but if you have anything to add, I'd love to hear from you too. Now, the, the, the key is, is a farmer really interested in this uh, humus and compost cycle? So, um, and the second is, does he has a right location and does he has the human resources and some of the equipment he can provide? And this has then to be decided between the municipality, the responsible or the entity that is local entity that is responsible for the waste collection or the, for the waste management. Um, uh, so usually we we have a sort of a concours. So there is a, a, a an, an article in the local newspaper. We are looking for a farmer who is interesting to do the job, and then there are two or three farmers coming up and they are invited, and then we explain them what's coming up. <laughs> so what would be their duty and their their task? It could be including the separate collection, the collecting part, or it's just receiving the organic waste that is collected by another, by the municipality or by a collection company. And then <clears throat> he's doing the job of composting from, from, the, from the gate of the composting plant down to the marketing and everything. So it is a side job or an additional job, he has to become a professionalist, a, a professional compost producer. It's nothing that he should do just by, you know, um, uh, in the late afternoon or in the evening. It, it must be clear that he needs time for that to maintain the composting plant of, plant of a professional level. Um, in that case, I can say um, the key issue there is not to find interesting farmers, but to find the right location and and uh, to to sort out to identify if the farmer has the capacity to do the job in the right way. And this is a little bit uh, an issue that has to be taken into account at the beginning. But from that on, if this is okay. Uh, if I talk about location, the minimum we try to achieve is at least 250, 300 meter distance from the next uh, settlement or residential area or permanent residence or restaurant or something like that. Yeah. And then the local climate has to be taken into account to prevent later on, you know, all the problems and complaints by the neighbors and so forth. If I understood your question <laughs> correctly. Yeah. I think so. Ramon, do you have any insights to share? Uh, all, all the things that Florian said, uh, I absolutely agree with him. Just to add uh, that in some cases that we found uh, that the farmers look for the model or could be interested in the model because of the compost. As I said, that it's not easy to, especially if those farmers that are looking for organic farming and they are performing organic farming, they need compost. And they, they here in Spain, to find a high quality compost that could be labeled as organic is not easy. The, the production is quite reduced. So if they find the opportunity to do it by themselves and they, they make the numbers and they say, okay, it is possible for me, then it's a, it's a good incentive for, for them in, in our case. Yes, compost is a, a high quality compost um, is and not always easy to, to come by. You have to consider it is an additional income also, but they have to provide service for that income. So our gate fee for, for, for taking over uh, organic kitchen waste is be, in, in order to cover all the costs, including the revenue, it's between 50, 55 to 65 euros per ton. And that is needed to do a professional job. Um, uh, this refers to paved and sealed and professional composting plants that are constructed on a, on a, on a high level. Um, I, I forgot to mention that up to 300 cubic meter uh, of green waste only, so garden park waste only, 
in Austria, it is allowed to do the compostum and open ground, even the intensive frotting phase, the first frotting phase. I, I try to increase this, uh, this threshold because we have found even if it's 1,000 cubic meters per year, uh, it wouldn't do any harm if you do a, a, a good job. Um, <clears throat> it could be open ground if, if you are uh, in a certain distance from surface water, from rivers or whatever, from a lake, and you don't have groundwater problems or a nearby well or whatever. But in normal cases, even on open ground, if the ground is capable to carry your machines and so forth, you can do it up to a certain uh, quantity. Right. Okay. Well, um, just to get to a couple more questions from, from the audience, I would love to continue talking about this, um, but maybe another time, um, just to uh, trying to compare it to what I what we're seeing in the US. Um, there's just lots of questions that are coming up for me, but um, a question, a clarification for you, uh, Ramon, was in the examples that you gave, were, are there composters coming onto the farm to do the composting and the farmers receive the compost in the end? Uh, or are the farmers actually doing the composting themselves? I don't think I understood the question. You mean so, they, they, are the farmers they in the examples that you in some of the examples yes. you gave are they actually doing the composting or is there a separate entity that comes in and actually does the composting on the farm no no they do it but in, in all the cases they do it by by, by themselves but in for example in that uh, with the hotels they have external support uh, by myself and and others to teach them and if they have any problem or any doubt they just immediately phone me or send me an email to see it's happening this what i can do that that's all but they do it in every in all those cases they do it by by, by themselves okay well thank you for that clarification um for you florian um someone early on in your presentation asked if you could clarify the need for clay um uh, adding clay into the composting mix to create st stable humus. Yeah, this is basic knowledge of soil formation. Uh, lecture number one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that after uh, 10,000 years ago, when the glacier disappeared, you have just sand and gravel and so forth. And then, uh, uh, 100 year by 100 year by 100 year, uh, the soils were formed. Uh, by a combination of further degradation and weathering of the mineral substance into the small, small pieces less than two micrometer. And when it's less than two micrometer in particle size of minerals, this is secondary minerals, clay minerals, they become um, uh, pl plastic, uh, how do you call that? <laughs> they can take up water. Yeah. And they are performed and constructed in layers and they can take up and absorb minerals like calcium potassium and they have also um, an electric load uh, in the surface which is negative and this combines now not only with minerals like calcium magnesium potassium etc but also with degradation compounds from the organic breakdown of peptides and um, uh, um, carbohydrates, etc., from assimilate from the plants that are micro that are degraded by microbial activity. And those um, macromolecules uh, also have uh, in their outer layer uh, of, uh, a positive loading. And, and this is connected now with the surface of these uh, secondary clay minerals and they build a protection layer around these we call it humic compounds that we don't know exactly what it is chemically speaking we we have a guess yeah <laughs> in our in, in in our workbooks yeah um, but at the end this clay compound is very very important to stabilize the uh, partly degraded and stabilized organic um, uh, compounds from microbial decomposition. 
And this is this is the basic knowledge, and it is not taken into account because of costs. Uh, so big facilities consider if they have to add, I don't know, 10% by volume or by weight, what, take what you want, uh, of clay, clay soils into the composting process. This is a lot of effort. They need additional storage uh, area and this costs money. But at the end, the stability and the quality of the humus compound they produce is less. And uh, this is a lesson we learned from basic uh, soil formation lectures. Yeah. Thank you for and that. That was, that, was, that was taught uh, by the pioneers of composting in the 1950s already, but it was forgotten for a long time. Yes, it wasn't until I had the opportunity to study with uh, some composters in Austria a few years ago that I, I heard of uh, clay being added. So um, hopefully we were are resharing some forgotten knowledge there. Um, so a final question for both of you, um, and I'm going to make it a two-part question. Um, someone commented that it's great that restaurants and hotels are getting involved um, in these efforts. Are there grocery stores uh, getting involved too? And are you aware of any examples that use uh, vermicomposting uh, as the processing technique? Grocery stores, in the first example that I that I use, in those that were the pioneers here in Spain, yes, they are they're taking some organic wastes from food wastes from grocery stores. So it's it's also possible. It's that kind of generators that could be really uh, welcome in this kind of, uh, of models. But as I said, it's the same that hotels or restaurants. It's quite easy to separate it and have a good quality. And with vermicomposting, some, for example, the uh, that project in Mallorca, the end of the maduration process, they do it with worms. So they perform vermicomposting at the end, but just for maduration, not at the beginning. And uh, now we are working also in in another facility, also very small, that will, part of it will be the, the production of, of vermicompost. So it's it's been a really, really possible, but it's much better to be sure that everything is under control if you do it after, at least after the fermentation stage of the composting process. Mm -hmm, that makes sense. Florian, uh, any uh, examples of either grocery stores being involved um, I assume they must be, um, and then if you know of any vermicomposting that's happening in Austria. Yeah, also the groceries, supermarkets, etc., are obliged to provide separate collection. Usually they contract a professional collection company. Um, so it depends on the size of the village and the groceries, etc., if they are involved in the uh, agricultural composting scheme where also the farmers do the collection. So they're involved partly with these on-farm composting, but for the for the bigger supermarket chains, I would say not so much. But we have big composting plants, of course, uh, that are run by farmers up to 15 to 20,000 tons per year. Uh, they are, they are not providing the collection, but they receive if the grocery are involved in the general separate collection scheme run by the municipality, uh, then. Uh, uh, they have to implement the source separation for the organics and then it is included also. And vermicomposting, <laughs> there is only one professional example and this facility uh, does uh, exactly as Ramon said, a, a maturation phase more or less we could say. So after uh, uh, I think it's six weeks of intensive uh, high temperature composting phase, active composting phase, but he's uh, in this case only uh, um, uh, green manure, so means grass clippings and alpha alpha etc from the farm, manure and green waste. So garden and park waste uh, is composted without kitchen waste. And that is then fed to a very professional um, vermi farm, compost farm, uh, with automatic harvesting uh, the, 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 the warm uh, 
the wrong compost and so forth. I'm teaching it for home composting intensively in a very simple way, because with warm composting, there's nearly no need for turning if you do it in the right way. <laughs> um, it, it can be done very simple, with a very simple performance, with a simple, uh, similar equipment as uh, Ramon showed it from, from the compost boxes from the community composting facilities. Just a little box, put a little bit on the top and let the worms do the job. And in 10 days, you don't see anything anymore from the kitchen waste. So. Great. Yes, we, um, we uh, advocate or teach uh, worm composting for the home scale, but we, are, we yeah. do see <laughs> it in the community scale as well. So um, yes. fabulous. Really Thank you both so much for staying longer to answer some of those questions. I'm sorry if we didn't get to everybody's questions, but um, I really appreciate this opportunity to learn from the models you have been involved with in Austria and Spain, uh, Florian and Ramon, and I just really appreciate your time. And uh, thank you all for participating. Good luck to everybody. Thanks to you, you're welcome. Okay, thank you and take care everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, bye Ramon. <laughs>